We're here to talk about cost-effective cluster sharing with GKE multi-tenancy. If you listen to yesterday's keynote, you heard um, Eyal Manor talk about how it is very important for our customers to deliver value to their own customers quickly and to be able to iterate quickly. I'm sure this is very important to all of you as well. And of course, our customers, um, and you as well, want to deliver value to your customer at the minimum cost possible. So we're here to talk about how a GKE multi-tenancy strategy fits into this picture. My name is Katerina Probst. I work at Google, and I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about why GKE multi-tenancy is something that you might want to consider. Um, Shahid Masood will talk about the what and the how of multi-tenancy. And then finally, Carl Eisenberg from Cruise Automation will give us a customer perspective, a real-world scale use case of multi-tenancy in practice. So let's spend just a couple of minutes talking about why multi-tenancy. At a glance, Kubernetes is a user or a set of users interacting with a master Master holds the API server, the scheduler, other things. And the master is responsible for managing a set of nodes that run your actual application. Right? So when you have one cluster and one user, things are relatively straightforward. Right? User interacts with the master. Master manages the nodes. But what happens when you have multiple users and multiple clusters? Um, so think, for, in, for instance, if you have many teams in your own organization that have to run different applications, or you know, even external customers that run different applications. So what happens when you set up a separate Kubernetes stack for each one of your, uh, each one of your users? And I want to give you two things to think about, going back to our cost and velocity arguments. So think about how this scales financially. Having a completely separate stack um, if you look at this, one of the things you will notice is that you now have a proliferation of these clusters, right? And one of the things that you now um, don't have the easy ability to do anymore is to share resources among these applications. This is something that we hear from customers and that also gels with my own experience. Oftentimes, what you have is you have applications that run at different times of the day. So you might have some applications that take a lot of user traffic during the day. And then you might have some applications that you can run, for instance, batch applications that you can run at night. And you want to have the ability to use one set of resources to run both of these easily. Another thing to think about is, how does this proliferation of clusters scale operationally? This is also something that's very close to my heart. If you have a lot of different clusters running, now you have tens or hundreds or thousands of dashboards that you need to understand and manage. Now you have to figure out how to um, apply policies across all of those consistently. You have to figure out how to um, apply, for instance, networking or other um, kinds of setups consistently across all of them. How do you roll out new versions and so forth? So those are the kinds of things where if you reach a certain scale, it becomes more difficult to manage all of these clusters. Now, an alternative to this approach of setting up a separate cluster for each app is to have a shared cluster, so a multi-tenant cluster. And the way this will work, generally, is that you have a large cluster with a large set of nodes, and you split it up by namespace and assign an application to a namespace. And now you can have multiple users that own different applications running in the same cluster. One pattern that we've seen, and that Carl will talk about in, in greater detail, is different teams having their different applications that run in different namespaces, as I just said, on a shared um, Kubernetes cluster or set of Kubernetes clusters. And then that also gives you the ability to build platforms on top of that that, again, um, gets you to this place where you can be far more consistent across all of the apps that are running on these shared clusters. Now, with that, I will hand it off um, to my colleague, Shahid, and he will talk about the what of multi-tenancy and, uh, and the how. Uh, 
All right, so first let's try to be on the same page in terms of what multi-tenancy means. Uh, in our context, we're looking at features that are part of Kubernetes engine that support multi-tenancy, and from the Kubernetes engine point of view, the things that we want to be able to do are to provide isolation and fair resource sharing for the users of a cluster within one single cluster. So we want to make sure that the users aren't able to hog resources or step on each other's toes as they're sharing one cluster in a multi-tenant environment. The other thing to understand is what your tenants are like. So you can think of your tenants as whether you trust them, whether you somewhat trust them, or whether they're untrusted. So a trusted tenant would be uh, teams within one company where you know what kind of code they're deploying. Uh, you may have some audit processes or some other checks and balances that make sure that only certain type of components get deployed in your cluster. So that's what I mean by a trusted um, tenant. They could be, you may not have as rigorous audit procedures in place and the, and the tenants, you still trust them, but they can deploy any sort of code in the cluster as well. And on the other extreme, you have non-trusted users or tenants who can deploy anything. Basically, you're providing a platform where users bring their code and they, they run their code in your platform. So if you, are, you have the non-trusted tenants, uh, you may want to look at this uh, new feature with GKE called GKE Sandbox, which uses GVisor to add an extra layer of security uh, between the container and the infrastructure. So it, it provides defense and depth capabilities without requiring much change in the, uh, in the application. So you may want to um, see this session, which we will talk more in detail about multi-tenancy using Sandbox. Back to this session, we are focusing mainly on the use case where you trust the tenants and you know the kind of code that they're deploying in the cluster. So with that out of the way, let's look at how you might implement multi-tenancy. There are four things that you want to be careful of when you're, when you're setting up multi-tenancy. You want to set up the right access control. You want to set up the right way of resource sharing, a fair way of resource sharing. You want to be able to isolate certain, uh, uh, cer certain users and workloads from other workloads and users. And then you finally want to see what your users are actually doing. You want to see how much resources they're using and, and so on and so forth. So let's look at each in detail. First, let's look at access control. So GCP at a higher level provides a mechanism of access control using projects and identity and access management. So project is a, is a high level uh, primitive which allows you to sort of group resources and then allows you to pr provide roles to users within uh, for those resources. So one key takeaway here is that when you add a role uh, for, in, uh, for a user for a project, it applies to all the clusters in that user. So if you give someone the Kubernetes engine developer role for a project, they'll have that role for any clusters that are contained in that project. So for that reason, one thing that we recommend for, uh, to our customers is to separate your environments at least in different projects. So your production environment should be one project and your non-prod uh, could be another project as well. So that way, if you give someone access to the non-prod, they don't automatically have access to the production environment as well. So that's one uh, key point to remember. And then within, uh, within the clusters, you have the boundary of namespaces that you can use to separate out different users and tenants within the cluster. So next, let's look at what how the, the users are authenticated and authorized to, to use resources in a cluster. So it's a three-step process. There's authentication, authorization, and then there's admission control. The authentication is provided by the IAM that we saw earlier. So the roles that the users have in the project would determine whether they can access this cluster or not. And at a minimum, you need the get uh, permission on the, um, the, con uh, the, the container a API of GKE uh, to be able to access this cluster. And then it's up to the role-based access control that are part of Kubernetes uh, that determine what that user can do in the cluster. So you want to set up the right roles and, um, and, uh, and, and bind those roles to those users. So the roles come in two uh, flavors in Kubernetes. One are cluster roles, which are cluster-wide. So you want to be careful as to who you give those roles, because these 
cluster roles go across namespaces. And since you're limiting your tenants to individual namespaces, you're most likely going to uh, need to create the roles for each namespace and then give those roles to uh, the appropriate users of that, um, of that namespace. And you can also, uh, you, can, you can create, you can bind these roles uh, with Google Groups as well. This is a new beta feature that has come out. A lot of our customers uh, were requesting this feature so that they can assign the roles or cluster roles to Google Groups and then manage users by adding and removing them from those groups. Then the next step in the process is admission control. So before an uh, Kubernetes resources persisted, Kubernetes uh, makes sure that it meets your, your admission criteria. And this is an opportunity for you to modify that and allow and disallow certain objects, or you can change those objects to add some default values or uh, you know, change them to meet your policy. So that's another uh, mechanism that's available to you to do that. One more feature, so those are for the users. How about the workloads that are running in your system? So this is another area where our customers um, have to do some manual workarounds to get past that. We have a new feature which is hitting beta soon called workload identity. What it allows you to do is use GCP service accounts to give your workloads access to GCP resources without you having to manage the keys or providing these keys to the pods. GCP will take care of that for you. And this resolves a number of uh, workarounds that our customers had to implement in the past. Um, and you know, in, typically, you either use the identity of the node where the workload is running to access GCP resources, but you can imagine in a multi-tenant environment that's not desirable because the same node can be hosting different types of, uh, of, work, uh, of workloads for different users, so you don't want to do that. And it also uh, takes the burden away from, from the administrators of either downloading the key and then manually managing that key and providing that to the workloads that they want. So that's a great new feature to, uh, that supports multi-tenancy. And there's a detailed talk on, on that feature also that you may want to um, look at to understand that feature in more detail. So next, let's look at resource sharing. Kubernetes, as I said, has a lot of, uh, lot of sort of uh, uh, mechanisms built into it to allow you to do that. You can define quotas, which is the aggregate um, sort of uh, resources that a namespace can have. You can add default values for resource limits and, um, and requests that you want, that the users can make for their workloads. You can also use pod, uh, pod affinity and anti-affinity to sort of split the workloads um, on across different nodes and, and sort of isolate them from each other. And then pod identity, uh, pod, pod priority can be used to um, sort of prioritize different workloads over the other, so high priority workloads can preempt lower priority workloads as well. Next, let's look at runtime isolation. Again, there are a number of features. I already mentioned sandbox pods that you can use to provide an extra layer of um, uh, security between the containers uh, you know, and, and audit what the containers can do. You can also set up the pod security policies and security contexts which limit, which allow you to limit what the pod can, um, what resources the pod can access, whether it can access the file system or it can run in the host network and so on and so forth. And network policy also allows you to determine which pods are able to communicate with one another, what, in, what uh, sort of network access those pods are allowed. So these are sort of primitives that are built into either Kubernetes or the Kubernetes engine um, that you can use. One challenge that this poses is there's a lot of policies that you have to manage. How do you apply those policies across multiple, multiple clusters that you might have and namespaces within those clusters? And also, uh, how do you ensure that the, the, that the policies that you want applied don't drift? People don't come in and change the policy and uh, you want to have better control on that policy. And that's where a new feature called Anthos Config Management comes in. How many of you uh, watched the keynote yesterday? So, so the keen observers may have seen the Anthos config management being used during the demo that they showed for Anthos to apply the different policies or changes to your cluster. What it allows you to do is 
to, to define your policy in a, in a central place. You can check that into a repo, so you can version control that. And then config management will automatically pull that policy and apply it to all the clusters that are enrolled in that uh, config management. So I'll give you a brief demo of that to show how that works. So I have a cluster uh, where I don't have any workloads running right now. And I have defined my policy into this repo that I have. And you can define any Kubernetes native resource. It doesn't have to be just those policies. You can, uh, you can define the quota. Here I have a quota defined uh, where I can have 70 pods in, in each namespace and so on. And I can also define deployment. So if you wanted to have some workloads running by default in those namespaces, you can, de uh, you can define that as well. So I have this, uh, uh, you know, this, this workload that I'm running in this namespace as well. So next what I'll do is I will uh, apply that policy in that cluster. So I have the config management operator already running in the cluster. And this is the operator that's looking at, um, at custom resources that define where your policy should be pulled from. So the way you do that is you, uh, you define a custom resource of type config management and you point it to the repo where your policy exists. So in this case, I'm pointing it to the repo that I just showed you, and I can specify which branch it should pull the policy from and apply to the cluster. So I'm using master, uh, depending on your own sort of um, uh, you know, branching uh, policy, you can choose the branch that you want. So what I'll do next is I will apply this policy into my cluster. And what that is doing is, essentially, what this will do is, it will uh, create you know, that policy in the cluster. So one thing you'll notice is, if I go back to the workloads, it will start a few processes that will start pulling the, um, the policy from the Git repo and start applying it um, o o in your cluster as well. So once this, this policy has, has been applied, what you will notice is that anything that I've defined in this repo will be applied to that, uh, to that cluster. And the, the namespaces that I've defined, blue and green and common, and the quota that I've defined will be applied to that cluster as well. So while, that is, uh, uh, while the, the policy is applied, I just want to uh, point out a few things here. Uh, one thing is that you can, since your policy and all of your resources are checked into a repo, you can use your, uh, your sort of uh, build pipeline to make sure that any changes in the policy are validated through some tests, they're reviewed, whatever process you have for the review, and then once the review is complete and you merge those changes back into the branch that you want to apply to the cluster, that config management will automatically deploy it in the cluster for you. And another great feature of config management is that if someone tries to go in the cluster and change some of those policies, they try to change some of those values, config management will detect that change and it will reapply that change back in the, uh, make sure that the cluster conforms to the checked in policy in the repo. So it will it, it'll continuously reconcile the changes in the policy um, with, with what's in the repo. So let's go back and see if this has started. So as you can see, it started that, and the other thing that you would notice is the Hello World deployment that I had defined in here is now um, has, been, has been created in the cluster as well. So let's say if you wanted to change some of those, so let's say I want to uh, change, the, um, uh, you know, change the quota, I, I want to make a change. So what I can do is I can again follow my workflow for pushing changes to the Git repo. So here I have a change that I, I've made to the quota that I want to apply to the, uh, to the, to the repo, to the, to the cluster as well. So what I will do is I'll add that change and then I will commit that change 
And once I push that change into the, um, into the repo, config management will automatically apply that change into the cluster. And now if I look at the quota in that namespace, what you will see is that the quota is 15, and, uh, 50, and it has changed from 70 to down to 50. So this is an easy way to make sure that your, uh, your, your policies always stay in sync with what you have, whatever you've defined in your repo. So getting back, so this, there's a more detailed session where we talk ab about uh, the config management. So you may want to check out that session as well. Um, it's later tomorrow. So let's finally look at how do you get to know what your uh, tenants are up to in the, in the cluster as well. So for that, we have a new feature in GKE called usage metering. What it allows you to do is capture the resource usage that your users have in, in the namespaces that they've been assigned to. So you can capture um, usage of memory, CPU, and other resources in the cluster. It will put that data in a BigQuery data set that you can later analyze and visualize as well. Uh, the important thing is this does not automatically generate the billing data for those tenants, but you can combine that data with your billing, GCP billing data to figure out how to bill your tenants as well. And you can visualize that, that data using something like Data Studio to see what your tenants are doing. So these are just some of the features that can help you set up multi-tenancy, but we have uh, you know, a real use case from Cruise Automation, and I'd like to invite Carl to come up here and walk us through their use case. Hey, uh, I'm Carl, and uh, I'm the tech lead manager of the PaaS team at Cruise. Cruise is... Uh, doing self-driving vehicles in San Francisco. If you've uh, been around here a while, you've probably seen our cars driving around San Francisco. And we try to connect people with the places, things, and experiences that they care about doing this. Uh, this is a visualization from one of, the, one of our other open source tools that you can find more information about on our blog, but it's basically visualizing the LiDAR da data and our mapping data together. Uh, so one of the problems we had at Cruise when I started uh, probably a year and a half ago is a, a cluster proliferation problem. Um, so we had a whole bunch of SREs that were deploying Kubernetes clusters uh, on AWS at the time. And uh, it, what we ended up with was like one cluster per team effectively. Some of them were sharing, some of them weren't. Um, and they were all kind of special little snowflakes. Uh, most of them weren't upgradable. Some of them had like defaults still configured, like one year time bombs on uh, the root CA, which would then expire and then lead people to frantically replacing them. So uh, one of the ways we, we solved this later was moving to GKE. But uh, the way we did immediately was to uh, start up a PaaS team to work on uh, sort of centralizing the development of a platform as a service at Cruise on top of Kubernetes. Uh, at, at Cruise, we have a lot of workloads that are uh, fairly diverse. So we, we do ML and data processing, backend services, reporting batch jobs, productivity tools, continuous deployment, continuous integration, uh, platform add-ons. And a lot of these were already in containers. So we were, we're pretty cloud native. We're just trying to you know, become more production ready before we launch our services in the coming years. So uh, some of the reasons why we went into multi-tenancy or why we decided to invest in multi-tenancy, uh, one was cost savings. We, we already recognized that we were spending a bunch of money on these masters running Kubernetes clusters. And we didn't really need them because we weren't maximizing the masters. Um, in our proliferated clusters, they also weren't even highly available masters. So moving to a central cluster allows us to move faster with that central cluster and get it to a more production-ready, mature state, which helps us towards uh, our production readiness goals of you know, being easier to audit, having central observ observability, having dashboards that were mature, built-in backups, auto-scaling, all that kind of stuff. Uh, that if you spread out to your teams, they might not get in the same pace or even ever. Um, and then the other thing we, we care about a lot was developer productivity or velocity. Uh, and so some of this was around centralizing the ingress and egress for, for NATs and load balancing. Uh, and some of it was around centralizing config management and image building and continuous deployment, basically all trying to get our developers to have to consider less of that. Um, and also to free up our SREs so that they 
um, could focus on other tasks rather than having to build the platform themselves. So at Cruise, we also have a hybrid private network, which kind of biased a bunch of our uh, decision making. We already are in this complex multi-cloud world where we have AWS and GCP and on-premise resources. And so connecting all this, uh, thankfully the platform team didn't have to do by ourselves. We have a, a NetEng team uh, that works with us and, and a good security team that, that integrates with all of us. Um, to sort of build out this, this private networking platform. But there's a whole bunch of other pieces underneath Kubernetes that you need to be concerned about uh, and make sure that those are also set up to be multi-tenant. Uh, one of the ways we did that was by, as was recommended, having separate projects for separate environments. But we also did a foldering structure uh, so that we could completely isolate our production environments and be able to audit which, uh, which like, projects in GCP were production projects. That way we could easily go see uh, what their security state was, what the logs were for the production stuff, and, and mostly security and, and, and other teams that were going and doing audits didn't have to pay attention as much to the development because it was completely isolated. Um, so we, we did these, these folders and then we have teams that had a set of projects and then these projects are in each of the, the folders. Uh, there's probably multiple team folders. So one of the things that get put in these folders or these projects that are in the folders is like NetEng manages its own networking infrastructure inside their own projects. And then they share that network with the other projects. So none of the other projects even have a default network local to those projects. They just share the, the one that's managed centrally. And then uh, the teams would want to use their own SaaS products. Sometimes they use GCE stuff as well. Uh, so Cloud SQL is a good example of having your database inside of your team's project so only the team has access to that data. The platform team doesn't need or want access to your production data. The NetEng team probably doesn't either. So it keeps a good isolation between teams. And then this also means that the, the PaaS team uh, or the platform team can handle the Kubernetes clusters inside their own project, which means that uh, while we have control of those projects, people outside of the central team don't have access to come play around with the Kubernetes settings. Uh, they just get access to the Kubernetes that's running on it. So in Kubernetes, in GKE, we also sort of emulated this matrix of multi-tenancy. So we have dev staging and prod shared clusters, and we also have namespaces that are assigned to those teams. Um, so this satisfied a good sort of MVP goal of getting everybody to only be able to see what they needed access to. So uh, each of them will run their pods, their pods are isolated across environments, and they're semi-isolated between teams as well, so the teams aren't stepping on each other's toes. So this is just a picture of some of the pieces we put together. Um, I think PaaS is a little bit of a controversial term, but in, in our context, uh, GKE by itself is not enough. We put a whole bunch of extra work and integrations into providing a platform for our internal tenants. So some of that is GCE components. Most of these little ones in boxes are, GC, are, are GCP components or configurations. So we have um, public and private load balancing routes, uh, which are a little bit different because GCP has different functionality for uh, different features. And then we control those with controllers that are then integrating with GKE. And then those controllers either have annotations or uh, CRDs that are in the Kubernetes API so that our tenants can self-service into the selection of those features. We also have a whole bunch of security observability and deployment functionality that we provide as a service to our internal tenants. Uh, and that means that they don't have to reinvent the wheel every time. And obviously, we didn't just stamp all this out on day one. Uh, it was sort of a growing experience. We've been doing this uh, for over a year now, and we moved to GKE about nine months ago. So uh, we, we took some of it from our existing deployments, and some of it we're still bidding out, like the external DNS uh, up there is like a controller for managing your DNS records. We don't have that uh, automatic at the moment. We're still doing terraforming. So uh, Vault integration is one of the things that we did early with help from our InfraSec team. Um, and our InfraSec team manages a, a highly available Vault cluster. And we 
decided to use Vault for secrets instead of just Kubernetes secrets, primarily because it, it provides a, a source of truth separate from an individual cluster. And, and this is a concern when you have multiple clusters. If you're small enough that you can survive on one cluster and you don't want to have multiple clusters per environment, then you can just use Kubernetes, Kubernetes secrets. But when you have this proliferation of clusters, you have to start concerning yourself about single source of truth external to the cluster and integrations. So this is a fairly standard pattern. Our sort of contribution to that is a Daytona uh, init container that we wrote that authorizes with Vault and downloads the secrets using, uh, let me step back, it logs into Vault using the service account in your that's injected into your Kubernetes pod. So that's a, a default Kubernetes feature and then a, a Vault configuration feature that's baked in. And then Daytona we added that does sort of the glue to stick it together. It uses an in-memory volume. That's to make sure it doesn't uh, write anything to disk and it won't get persisted outside of the lifecycle of your pod. And then it slurps it in through an app container uh, volume mount so that you can either read it from your application or your application can have an entry point script that converts from like a, a, a file to an environment variable. Um, so another thing we did is GCP service account uh, integration through Vault. So as was mentioned, um, the pod identity feature was not available when we started doing this. Um, and so one of the things this allows us to do is provide the, the pods with their own identity from Vault using a GCP service account. Um, so that means that we can authorize these things before the pod exists, and the pod can go out and perform GCP actions. Uh, and the, probably the primary one is uh, talking to the database. So they use that with a sidecar proxy to talk to Cloud SQL, for example. Um, so once you get into this sort of central managing of Vault, you end up having to manage your namespaces in Vault a little more carefully. You can't just have everybody writing secrets wherever they want. So uh, what we went with was some prefix that's specific to us and then um, sort of a namespacing pattern that allows for uh, isolating the environments and the namespace and the application secrets, which means that I can say this team has permission to write to all of the environment secrets for all of the applications under their namespace, uh, but other teams don't have access to even see or list those. Uh, and then the application itself only has access to see the secrets for its environment, for that specific app, for that namespace. And that allows us to granularly control permissions in Vault. Uh, we ended up doing a sort of GitOp, GitOps workflow to provision Vault configuration in order to enable that. Uh, another thing we did was group role binding. So we wrote this about six months, or open sourced it about six months ago. and. Um, this was to make up for the lack of role binding, which is a, a beta feature now uh, for Google Groups. But uh, it didn't used to exist, and we built in uh, a couple more features into this. So, so one of the things that was explained earlier is that you can't necessarily use the project level uh, role roles in order to bind at the namespace level. So what we had to do was build out namespace admin, namespace editor, and namespace viewer, and give those to individual groups. So we map those to groups, and the team gets that group membership. That means I can have a, a Google group, and there's some manager that owns it, and the manager just goes adds new team members or removes team members that leaves. And then they don't have to perform a, a role binding manually. This RBAC sync functionality is a controller that will watch a configuration in a CRD, and the CRD says this group gets this permission. Um, and so then it will map that out to the bindings by reading through Google Groups to figure out who's in the group. Uh, another functionality that we stuffed into this was the ability to put service accounts in groups, because currently Google Groups don't support that. Um, so what that means is that we can give a, a service account a specific role and then add it to a group whenever we make new service accounts. And we can use GCP service accounts to do that rather than just Kubernetes service accounts. So there's a couple things that are sort of unsolved or you know, bleeding edge problems uh, that we're still kind of trying to work on. So one of those is Kubernetes operators in a tenancy environment. The CRDs are global definitions in Kubernetes. So you can't necessarily allow your namespace tenants to create CRD definitions. They, you, so what we, we do is we, as a cluster operating team, deploy CRD definitions and then allow them to make CRD 
resource objects in their namespace, but that means you can only have one uh, sort of permutation of that CRD at a time because CRDs weren't designed for multi-tenancy. Um, so that means we're effectively helping people deploy operators. Also, the container registry is uh, tenant tenantized at the uh, the level of Google projects or GCP projects rather. So. If you want full isolation between teams, every team has to manage their own GCR. Um, otherwise, what we do is we host a central one for development purposes and give everybody like admin to it. That means they have uh, push and delete functionalities. Um, and then uh, everybody can push to that, but we don't allow pulling from that for the production cluster. So our production cluster, we only give access to, to service accounts. And those service accounts are then used in continuous integration or, or building. Um, so all of the containers that run on our production environment, we know were pushed from CI. Um, Stack driver logging also uh, is tenantized at the project level. And because you have a shared cluster, that means that uh, all of the logs from all of your containers are emitted to the same shared project, which creates a little bit of a problem because we've only given people view access to that project. We didn't want to give them editor access to step on each other's toes, uh, which means they can't make uh, log to metric conversions or log dashboards. So in order to enable that, we had to build a, a fan out system uh, that will take Fluent, Fluent D, uh, Stackdriver, and uh, emit to other projects from specific namespaces. Um, Datadog metrics, we use Datadog instead of Stackdriver for our metrics right now, um, and primarily that allows us to aggregate them all, but it's also not super multi-tenant. Um, so you might have both a fan out and a fan in problem with both logging and metrics because your auditors might want to see all of them and your teams just want to see the ones they care about. So uh, GCP has the ability to like slurp all your logs into one auditing project. So we, we use that for auditing and then we use this other fan out solution for uh, the tenants. Uh, Spinnaker is another one where uh, we had to build our own op operator to make Spinnaker more isolated. Uh, because we have so many namespaces, we have like 20 namespaces per cluster and uh, maybe a dozen clusters, that means that, that we are doing account binding and role binding in Spinnaker to isolate who can deploy to what from Spinnaker, which is a little complicated. And then on, on resource isolation, probably one of the weaknesses of Kubernetes in general for multi-tenancy is that there are some things that are not well isolated yet. So like CPU and memory are great, they're isolated, you opt into it, and then you have that amount of resource. Uh, it even has preemption on those. But like local disk space, it, there's a beta feature in Kubernetes that isn't in, in GKE yet, so we can't isolate that yet. Disk I.O. is completely unisolated in Kubernetes, so if you are on spinning hard drives, which I don't recommend, uh, you can actually knock over the Docker uh, daemon if you use too much disk at the same time. So uh, we switched to SSDs, and that has mostly eliminated the problem, but it's, it's still unisolated. Uh, ingress and egress, I mentioned uh, us having solved those sort of at the platform level, but they're also a little bit unisolated. Uh, one of the ways we're hoping to get towards isolation in the future here is with, um, with Istio. So Istio uh, adds the sidecars to each container and allows you to monitor the ingress and egress from every container, which allows you to do sort of traffic management, but Kubernetes doesn't come with that by default. So there's a whole bunch of things we also want to do that we haven't done just to sort of uh, be an example of all of the things that you might want to consider when you're building not just a Kubernetes cluster, but a multi-tenant, multi-environment, private cloud, uh, hybrid network uh, cluster. So uh, one of the things I would recommend is to put in your defaults and quotas before you put tenants on your system. Because what we've learned is now that we've gone and had people on our systems, we can't add quotas without breaking them. Uh, so we have to do an analysis on like who's using what and then make them per namespace quotas uh, and then add like a GitOps approval process and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so that's a little complicated. Do that up front. Uh, we would also like to go to project isolation instead of team isolation. And what I mean by that is reducing the blast radius of a compromised project. So if someone comes in through a web app API or something, compromises a web app, um, and then they have like control over the container for whatever like one weakness in your application. You don't want it to be on the same network in the same namespace uh, with everything else that team is running. You want to sort of reduce the blast radius. So there's a bunch of different ways to do that. One of them is with by having smaller namespaces, and another one is by doing um, the sort of network policy that, that restricts who has access to what. 
another one is with pod security policy, which is reducing what the pods can actually do. Um, and then uh, a couple of these other functionalities, webhooks uh, have been talked a lot about, about a bunch in the Kubernetes environment for or ecosystem for sort of restraining or enforcing what people can apply to your cluster. Um, but there's no sort of off the off the shelf solution for that. There's uh, there's OPA, which is um, a policy sort of administrator that uh, can do some webhooks for you. But the poli there's no like built in policies that you can just slap in place. So um, there's some work to be done there. Uh, and then we would also like an automated build system. I'd really love like a, a Docker Hub automated build for on premise behind my firewall, but it doesn't really exist. So there's a couple of different products you can use. Uh, Cloud Builder is one of them. Um, Knative Build is another one. Uh, so we're going to be working on that. Micro segmentation of the network uh, also reduces blast radius. Uh, security would love us to get to that. Uh, we're hoping to get there with Istio and network policies. And usage meter metering was talked about. It's great. We're going to get there, but like because it is still beta, we haven't played with it yet. Um, and then service RBAC is also kind of important with your users to services or user to Kubernetes. That's built in with GKE. You get, you get your Google uh, user auth, and then you can do role binding against users. But once your application is running, how do your applications authorize with each other? And this is kind of a problem everybody has to solve. Um, and there's no sort of out of the box solution that I know of yet. Um, and to end TLS is another one. GKE doesn't uh, come with this built in. Uh, you can use sort of a let's, let's encrypt controller solution, but we wanted one that would allow us to do both public and private domains. So then we need to host our own CA and automate the controller for it and then make it different from the public one, uh, that kind of thing. Plus, we don't really want to be inserting TLS cert certificates into every uh, pod. We'd rather inject to the load balancer and then have service mesh handle the last mile encryption. That way, we're not uh, putting secrets that can be compromised down into the pods. We have sort of a two-layer encryption scheme. Um, so basically, uh, moral of the story, if you're, if you're big enough to build a platform here on top of Kubernetes, which Kubernetes is a platform for building platforms, then you're probably big enough to make it multi-tenant. Uh, Multi-tenancy does require additional work on top of Kubernetes, and I wouldn't necessarily say it's for everyone. Um, but if your alternati is, alternative is uh, multi-environment or, or multi-instance, then you're going to have to build some layer underneath it that allows you to deploy a bunch of clusters. And so if you're already building a layer, you might as well uh, make it multi-tenant instead. So there's obviously trade-offs and pros and cons, so take it with a grain of salt. But that's our experience, and I think we've got it pr working pretty well. If you go in a car uh, in cruise or you see those driving around, those are all talking to our cloud with the back end running on multi-tenant Kubernetes. All right. Thank you, Carl, for sharing uh, you know, the journey of cruise automation to using uh, Kubernetes in a multi-tenant fashion. Uh, I just want to close out with a few key sort of um, takeaways. So, you know, by centralizing, Kubernetes has a lot of, um, uh, like, learning that you have to do to understand how to run it well. And by specializing that knowledge with one team that operates your clusters, not only, you know, builds that s sort of center of excellence, which allows you to implement the best practices across multiple clusters, but it also frees up your developers to spend their time on developing stuff that, that adds value to your company. So I think that's some of the key takeaways. And then it gives you the operational efficiency by letting that specialized team of, um, uh, uh, to, to manage those clusters for you. Um, and it also saves you some infrastructure cost by consolidating a large number of clusters into a fewer multi-tenant clusters as well. And GKE has some new features that can help you set up that multi-tenancy, as we heard from Carl and Cruz. Um, there's still some work to be done, and you know, you'll, you'll see those features come out as well. Mm -hmm.